Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, for those departing to Sunday school, and for those doing homework, uh, in getting us ready for Christmas Eve, uh, you can continue to do your homework. This is the blessing. Okay. I need light. You may not need light, but I do. So. 
I, I was really hoping to finish all 72 verses today, but I'm probably overly ambitious. <laughs> so, what's going on in Mark 14? Well, the final hours of Jesus' mission have arrived. Jesus receives an anointing for his burial, he instituted the Lord's Supper at his last Passover celebration, and predicted that his followers would desert him. He pleaded with his father in prayer that the cup he was about to drink be removed. But when it was evident that his father wanted his mission to proceed, Jesus willingly submitted to the Father's will and went to meet those sent to arrest him. In front of his accusers, Jesus sat silent until asked point blank whether he was the Messiah. He boldly affirmed that he was, at the same time that Peter was denying association with him and was condemned to die for his confession. So, if we get through the first part and the Lord's Supper, that may be a good place for us to stop so that Pastor Fro in January can begin the Bible study on vocation. And then we'll resume in 14 and do 15 and 16 and finish Mark. Before Ash Wednesday. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, read Mark 14, 1 to 11. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the anointment wasted like that? For this anointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you all always have the poor with you. And whenever what you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So in contrast, to the plotting of the religious leaders and Judas to kill Jesus. What did the women's actions, the woman's actions show? What did they show? Elsewhere in other gospel accounts, this perfume equaled about a year's wages. Yeah. Typical thing for bodily anointing or for dealing with 
heat-related issues of the head, um, sometimes used for the feet at the end of the day after washing them. They're dry, they're cracked. Yeah, you don't use Cetaphil, but use yeah, a nard. Um, how well it's fragrance depended on how costly it is, yeah, etc. So, what did Jesus say she was doing? So preparing him for burial. Preparing him for burial. There he is, healthy. Now, depending on how you date his birth, he's either 30 or 33 years of age. Average life expectancy was what in those days? 50. 70 to 80. Or 70 to 80. Yeah. yeah, it isn't until we end up with sanitation issues, increase in bacterial, that we end up with, you know, the middle ages, average life expectancy in the 30s. But it's still in Jesus' day, exactly what David said. Yeah. Three score by strength, four. So you can go on a span of 60 to 80. That's where the life expectancy is at that time. So here you have Jesus, 30, 33 years old, saying, she just anointed me for burial. Which some people say, what are you talking about? Yeah, you're young, you're healthy. And yeah, yet he was, in a sense, prophesying what was happening within days. Yeah, if you ever look at a Bible that does a timeline for all of these events, you realize you get yeah, entrance into Jerusalem that we call Palm Sunday, then you have Monday, then you have Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, yeah. We know the rest of it. So, how do Jesus' words in uh, verse 9 point beyond his death? What does he say in verse 9? The gospel is going to be proclaimed in the whole world. Yeah, in the whole world, the gospel is going to be proclaimed, and you'll be reminded of what has done. Yeah. So yes, he's pointing to uh, beyond his death by saying that the gospel would be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Uh, very much looking to the future. Um, the religious leaders wanted to get rid of Jesus quietly so as not to have him around and so as not to provoke a riot at this point. But, yeah. So, why was Judas' offer to betray Jesus important plan of the religious leaders that was expressed? They were looking for an excuse to arrest them, so it kind of gave them the... Yeah. Getting assistance. Yep. Because we just went through all the questions. The scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, had all tried to trick him, to publicly discredit him. They had failed. Judas comes up with a plan to assist them. They welcome any assistance from any quarter that it would come. Yes. Okay. Let's look at the next verses.
And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, and there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful, and they say to him, one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I don't want to get too far into a rabbit hole, but go back and look at um, verse 14. The teacher says, where is my guest room? Guest room. How does, how do all of our translators deal with that Greek word in Luke 2? There was no room for them in the inn. In the inn. Same Greek word. Here it's guest room. In Luke 2, it is in. Why would the Holy Spirit give us that word? We, every time we think of in, we think of some place that rents out rooms. But every house in Israel, you go in the front door, and you're on the ground level. And at the ground level, who occupies the ground level? The livestock. Pardon? The livestock? The livestock. And at the end of the ground level room where the livestock are, there's a trough where the animals feed. Major. Next level up, what do you have? Basically, the family living quarters, where the family occupies, where the family sleeps. And up on one side, a little level, is the food preparation area. And if you make a right turn out of the food preparation area is what? the guest room. 
the hostile. Yeah, Luther translates Luke 2 as the hostile, the herberger, not an inn, but the herberger, which would be like the hostile. So, we always think of Lord's Supper, upper room, we got a two-story house, you're climbing the stairs to the upper room. If you've just been able to picture animals ground level, one level up, you have living quarters. One level up, it's like huge stairs, huge steps, is the kitchen and the guest room, upper room. Yeah. So, just when you're thinking, so why was there no room in the inn? Mm -hmm. do, do we know that? <clears throat> because there was no such thing as hotels in Jesus' time? No. There were. There were such things as hotels if you consider a place to bring the animals in and a place for people to, s to sleep. There is, uh, maybe Rick saw it also, between Nazareth and Bethlehem on the traveled road, they have dug up the remains of a hostel uh, where people who were traveling could spend the night, feed the animals, and was basically a two-room affair. Had a big area for the animals with a manger, if you will, a feed trough. And then up a whole area where people could be sheltered for the night, not out in the open. Thing is, when you came into towns and villages, you didn't go down the street to Fairway or to Hilton Garden Plaza or Holiday Inn Express. <coughs> that just didn't exist in Bethlehem. What there were in Bethlehem were a lot of Joseph's relatives who weren't going to let a pregnant Mary who became impregnated under suspicious circumstances. Come on. An angel came and said the Holy Spirit did this? No. We're not letting that couple stay in our guest room. Not under our roof. There was no room for them. So somebody graciously let them be on the ground level with the animals. At least a roof over their head. Just curiously, that word you say is the same um, for Bethlehem and for the Monday Thursday dinner. Is it possible that that word can be made plural? So that in Bethlehem they use the plural form of it? I don't know. I'd have to look at that again. Yeah. Um, and I do not know what Art just does with that in his commentary. Um, using this largely from from Harry Wimp's uh, word, and I've looked at it as Harry went flying through it and said, oh, curiosity. Um, but I haven't looked as to whether it could be a plural. So you're beyond my knowledge base. Okay. So just as the covenant on Sinai was ratified by the by blood, so the new covenant um, that God was making with his people through his death 
of the Messiah would be ratified by the Messiah's blood. How did Jesus' words in Mark 24 echo Mark 10 and Isaiah um, 53, 12? And I print those out for you. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for transgressors. So how did Jesus' words in Mark um, 14, 24. Yeah. Echo Mark 10 and Isaiah 53. What could they all stress? Many who believed in him. Yes. Well, that he was going to die. He said, he gave himself, gave his life. The other one said, his death. Right. So that he would what pour out his life for the many who would believe in him, and remember that many in the Hebrew virtually means all who would believe in him. So we're not going to divide the room and say, the many are over here, and those aren't, even though we're all believers. It's all, all who believe in him. And, um, and then he would bear the sin of the world. Um, so what additional information about the sacrifice do the last two passages give. To what do Jesus' words in Matthew 14, 25 point forward? Well, he, he's working on the temptation as Savior. Yes. Well, I think he's also predicting his death. Right? Pardon? He's, he's also predicting his death and re-emphasizing that this is the last time. Yes. And if we pull out of previous parts, he's also pointing forward to his resurrection. Okay. That's in there. But the wedding banquet. The last day. The last day. The wedding banquet. The last day. The last day. The wedding banquet that he'll celebrate on that last day with his bride, the church. Yes. Yeah. New heaven, new earth kind of language. Dennis. Just, um, I have a question about 23, <coughs> 25. Just, just in the sense of the sequence of what was going on. He gave thanks and gave them the cup. They drank from the cup and then he explained what it was. Yes. From what the Jews celebrate today, there are four cups of wine celebrated in the current Passover celebration of the Jewish people. There is the cup of blessing. There is the cup of redemption. There is the cup of salvation. There is the Elijah 
cup. The first three are drunk. Two before the meal and one after the meal. So, when Luke gives us the Last Supper, we get, he took a cup, and we wonder, what do you mean? Nothing happens. And then, after the supper, he takes a second cup. That cup of salvation is also called the cup of the, it's in the text here. Covenant. Covenant. There have been so much ink spilled on testament and covenant, arguing one word over the other, that I finally got tired of trying to argue the words. But some of you will remember that before I retired, in the word of institution, I didn't say the um, cup of the New Testament. I always said, Covenant. Mainly because I was trying to pull on Jeremiah and everything from the Old Testament that said there is not a division here between old and new. There is former and renewed. Uh, Walt and then Rick. Well, to, the epistle today was ties into this whole thing, you know, where he basically says, you know, I'm the sacrifice, I'm the final sacrifice, I came to do God's will, this is it, and, you know, and, and then uh, the writer of Hebrews, you know, says, hey, here's your, here's your covenant fulfilled. Right, here's your covenant fulfilled. It's the covenant we live in. Yes, Rick. Uh, you, you started to touch upon it. Go ahead. This, the new covenant is given in Jeremiah. God changes the eternal covenant that he gave originally. And now he's written his law in man's heart, which is going to be salvation for everyone when Jesus dies. This is the covenant fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. Yet, yet in the old covenant, or in the former covenant, what do we have? We have a continual emphasis that this is not a covenant just for Israel, not for the 12 tribes. Every one of these 12 tribes have a commission yeah. to be the candle to the Gentiles. Okay, a light to the Gentiles. They're all called. And that's the original intention of the covenant. The covenant was never meant to be a private affair to one people and one nation. But we know how that goes. Yeah. We're here. Yeah, we're blessed. It's all for us. And there's one cult, there's two cults in the United States that basically say, all of God's promises are from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Canadian to the Mexican border. That's the chosen people, the chosen nation. And you get one of those cults, and boy, all of those who want to be extreme patriots, they can just meld Uncle Sam and God the Father together <laughs> into one being. <laughs> Yeehaw. Yeah. So, you know, that's you know can, what happens when you start getting along to it. Okay. Well, let's look at those words of uh, uh, twenty-two through twenty-five. All of us are familiar with the words of institution. We can say them in our sleep, right? But they're not all here, are they? So when we study yeah, the words of institution, 
What do we say? As the Lord said to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul. Because John doesn't have any words of institution for either baptism or the Lord's Supper. Talks a lot about them. But doesn't have specific words, specific command. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul. And that's where we bring from all accounts. Because what's here? He took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank of it. And he said, this is my body of the covenant, which is poured out for all, or many. Missing word? New covenant. You have to go looking for what? Matthew, get that word new. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, with the bread, take, this is my body. Nothing else. A whole bunch of things missing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul all agree on what words? Pardon? Body and blood. Yeah, this is, this my body, this my blood. Yeah, remember that word to be is going to be in the Greek or the Latin languages. When we go to the English, we have to supply that. But this my body, this my blood, all four accounts agree. All four accounts make real presence. So the argument between Luther and Zwingli at Marburg was very simple. Now, Zwingli said, it is not logically possible that Jesus can be present at every Lord's Supper in the known world at that time. And Luther <coughs> is supposed, according to legend, have just written two Greek words down. This, my body. The word says it, we believe it, and we don't try to get our heads around it. Luther's position. To which Swingley said, Luther is just a hard-headed German. <laughs> to which Martin Luther replied, Swingley is, you know the quote? A horse's ass. <laughs> yeah. By the way, until the seminary derailed me from doing an exegetical paper, my thesis was going to be on the Marburg Colloquy and on John 6. But, yeah. They derailed me into being a practical thesis on how to start missions. <laughs> Okay. Anything else on this? We will move forward even though I don't want to. <laughs> okay. Read Mark 14, 27 to 31. And Zechariah. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go, go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, 
this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. That right. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. According to Zachariah, <clears throat> of what pr process were the striking of the shepherd and the scattering of the sheep, the disciples, apart? Again, of what did Jesus assure his disciples in Mark 14, 28? What was behind Peter's declaration that he would follow Jesus into death before he would be dis disowned? What about the strike of the shepherd? What's that whole thing about the striking of the shepherd in Zechariah? Why is he doing this? It's another fulfillment of prophecy. Okay, another fulfillment of prophecy. But what is what is important about that prophecy fulfillment? Shepherd would die. Shepherd would die. But the real point comes in verse 9. The sheep will scatter. Sheep will scatter. And what is God up to in scattering the sheep? He scatters them so they can uh, proclaim to the Gentiles. Right. And in order for them to do that, what has to happen to them? They have to be refined. They have to be refined. Refined. Yes. They have to be refined. A purified people who would trust him as their God. Yes. That was the whole purpose of scattering the sheep, was to refine them. And if you look at ahead to crucifixion, what happens? People are scattered. The disciples are scattered. Everyone who believed in him were scattered. Post-resurrection out of absolute fear that they were going to die, he gathers 120. 120 who still have not totally given up hope. But at that point, they're more fearful than hopeful. Yeah. He scatters them to refine them, and then gathers them together. Yeah. And what did Jesus assure them in verse 28? He will go before them to Galilee. Yeah, there's two things there. One, Jesus assured his disciples, he's going to rise from the dead. And he's going to see them again in Galilee. Yeah, that's where the scattered sheep um, would be regathered. And then there's Peter's reaction. What was behind Peter's declaration that he would follow him? Yeah, 
let's not just look at the fact that he often overstated things and did you know, <laughs> dumb things now and then, but what? Faith. Faith. Loyalty. You know, think of this. Loyalty, love, faith were obviously there. But he didn't understand what? There's a weakness. How many of us think that we're ever going to commit a big, I don't want to mention it, kind of sin? No. We're all believers. We're anchored well in the faith. But put us in the right circumstance, surrounded by the right enemies of the faith. And how many of us might go down the tubes? That's me. That's me. Yeah, I would have gone down the tubes many times, uh, except for yeah, the fact that I have someone that keeps telling me to get on the right page. Yeah, it happens to be in this room. <laughs> Yes, he did not recognize his own weakness. He apparently did not understand Jesus' declaration that he would rise again. And according to tradition, Peter eventually did lose his life because of his association with Jesus. Okay, with that, let us close with the benediction of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.